our two sessions are really about uh, detecting genomic variation, right? So how do you actually go from the data that you've mapped onto the genome to detect either uh, the single nucleotide variants, uh, like, like we see here. Uh, so we were sort of looking at the data quite a bit in IGV yesterday, but now we're actually going to use uh, algorithms to call uh, these variants. Um, so the objectives of the module is really uh, sort of over, go over the, the steps to actually call variant, uh, understand the principles of variant calling, uh, know uh, what are the different steps that can affect and, and improve variant calling step, know how to filter, get rid of bad variants, annotate variants. I had already some questions yesterday about how do you annotate variants. Um, so call variants. So, so far the file formats and the files that we've uh, looked at a little bit were FASTQ files and also the BAM files after you've mapped them. We're going to look a little bit at the VCF format that was mentioned yesterday. Uh, which is the variant uh, calling format. So this is the files that you get that are much, much smaller, actually, that actually include the description of all the variants in your data. And then, and then we'll go back to uh, using some of the tools you've learned uh, yesterday and to visualize these SNPs and play in an IGV of it. Um, so uh, before I start, so I, I, I wanted to do a parentheses, and I, these are a few extra slides that I've added yesterday. Uh, because uh, we mentioned yesterday that, so even though for this workshop we're using Amazon uh, Cloud, uh, there's other resources, especially if you're Canadian, uh, you actually have access to, to what I think is a great resource, which is uh, these large clusters that are part of Compute Canada. So at McGill we have a cluster with 25,000 cores. Uh, Sherbrooke is another one. There's HPC for Health. We have some. Uh, this is in Toronto. But no matter where you are in Canada, you actually can request access to these clusters. Uh, you just sign up, or your PI needs to sign up, uh, and then you can get an account on these resources. And so the the types of commands and the types of tools that you use, uh, it's just really the same process. But instead of using the Amazon Cloud, uh, you can use these resources. Uh, so again, if you're Canadian, that's great. If you're American, well, that if, you know, if Trump gets elected, that's another reason to come to Canada. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we've installed many of the bioinformatics tools on these resources. Uh, so a, a lot of the tools that we're using now, you don't even need to install them. A bit like, like on your Amazon instance, the you know, GATK that we're going to be using, BWA for mapping, all of these tools are already installed. Um, so I've added some links that, that with information uh, on, on where you can find more information if you're interested. Um, and then the last bit, and this is related to uh, the Galaxy that you're going to be using this afternoon, but we also have set up uh, Galaxy on Compute Canada uh, as part of this project called GenApp. So uh, you won't be using this particular Galaxy instance, but again, um, if, if you en enjoyed that section this afternoon where you're using Galaxy, uh, and, and the public Galaxy is, is, is too busy, you could potentially use Galaxy from, from this side. But again, I mean, this sort of is, was just an aside. Uh, I think David will talk more about, uh, when he talks about Galaxy, we'll talk more about uh, the Galaxy instances that we've set up on, on Compute Canada. Um, okay, but, but back to the, the real uh, meat of the module and what we're going to be talking about. Uh, just a little bit of context. Um, <clears throat> You know, why, why is it interesting to call uh, variants? And why do we resequence? We've sequenced the human genome. Why do we resequence? So we resequence because we're interested in, in, in detecting both, both single, nucle single nucleotide variants and structural, larger structural variation across individual in the context of disease. So we want to know uh, if there are specific variants that are more uh, common in, 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 in people affected by a particular disease. In cancer genome sequencing, uh, I had some questions yesterday about the difference between somatic and germline mutations. So you acquire a new mutation, so you want every tumor has its own, has its own set of, of variants. So you actually, uh, that's one of the reasons why you would want to be uh, resequencing. Uh, and these are, are two examples that are a bit more uh, human-centric. And I guess uh, most of this module, we're, we're, we've been using the human genome as a reference. But of course, there's parallel application 
in, in many of the other uh, areas in which you work in, uh, but, and the principles are the same. So even though we're using uh, here the human reference genome as, a, as an example, uh, obviously the pipelines with, with some, some small differences, and, and uh, Jared yesterday talked about some of the differences and some of the challenge with some of the other genomes, but, but still, hopefully many of the principles that we're talking about here uh, also apply to, to your model organism. Um, so this is uh, similar, but like looks different than the slide that Mathieu showed, but um, this is a similar uh, workflow for variant calling analysis. So you start with some, some read trimming and, and you know, removing adapter, trimming for quality and so on. Uh, so that's what you see here on top. Uh, then there's the alignment steps. Uh, and then we move on to, to variant calling. Uh, and in parallel to that, it's, it's useful to look at some, uh, some various statistics. Uh, so in terms of the workflow, again, um, we start with quality control, which is very important. It's especially important for, for variant calling, because if your reads are, are, are very noisy and have lots of mistakes, that's obviously going to affect your variant calling. So it's good to, to take a look, because especially if you have... Um, you know, if you have a project with many, many data sets, uh, it's good to make sure that the profile of, of quality of your reads is similar across different individuals. Uh, because otherwise, you might end up with some outlier that have lots and lots of variants, and you wonder why. Well, it's likely because there was a problem with the sequencing, and the quality of the sequencing is not as good in some of the samples. So quality control, very important. Uh, Pre-processing, so this again is what you were doing with Mathieu yesterday, so trimming the reads, removing adapters, and so on. The mapping step, which is quite important, and again, that's what you did quite a bit yesterday. And now we move on to the, 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 the two other uh, sections, so calling small variants, uh, this is what we're going to cover, and then after the coffee break, uh, calling larger variants. Um, okay, so... I, Again, uh, one, just, I guess one more slide on this quality control, but it's really, really key that you look at your data before you start and at every step of the way. Uh, that's why IGV is such a great tool, for instance, uh, uh, you, you know, after you've mapped. And, and as you'll see, once you call variants, it's good to look at some of them to see if there's any patterns or if the data looks, looks reasonable. Uh, so that's really what we're going to be doing. Um, and then a couple comments, I guess, that, I, that I've made already, which is, you know, we're all the sample sequence uh, at the same time. Uh, are there some samples that maybe are a little bit weird? So it's good to, to look at. And that's why uh, many of the pipelines sort of generate statistics throughout. And it's good to look at these statistics to make sure that that, uh, that is it's quite uniform. And of course, you know, a lot of times I get, we, I mean, I and we get questions on, you know, what's what's good or what's bad. I mean, in, in some ways, it's, it's hard. It's more like you need you want to make sure that your data set is is uniform, uh, and then at some level, you get you get more uh, with experience, you get more familiar with what, what values to expect at some level. Um, okay, <clears throat> but this uh, particular module. So, what do we want to do? So, we want. Uh, to call single nucle nucleotide polymorphism and, and indels. Uh, so the goal is really uh, a little bit like we were doing yesterday, but yesterday we were just scanning it visually. Uh, the question is, so this is an example where uh, imagine that so the top is probably is a tumor, and then the bottom is a same sample from that individual, but from the blood. So what you see is that, you know, you have perfect matching to the reference, except for maybe a few errors that are sparse. So these are probably just sequencing errors. But once you sequence the tumor from that same individual, there's clearly a difference at that position. So I mean, you see that visually. How does uh, how does the, the computer know that this is an actual position? Um, so this is now a, a cartoonish version of the same thing. Um, so you know the sequencing. Uh, the uh, sequencers are great. By now, like Illumina sequencing is, you know, 99.9% .9 accurate for the most part, uh, but it still makes errors. Um, <clears throat> I guess, I mean, maybe a one, well, I'm not sure I'm ready to do mental math at this stage, but imagine, so if you have, you know, it's a hundred bases, right? So say it's 1% errors. 
let's make it easy. One percent errors, you have a hundred percent read, a uh, hundred basis read. So you have, you know, one error per read on average. But then sequencing run, you have a hundred million reads. So you do have a hundred million errors in your data set, right? So how do you distinguish the errors, which are going to be sort of random, from uh, an actual SNP where, and that's why we sequence such that every base is covered multiple times, because if, if you only cover a base one time, you won't be able to tell that this is an error, if you only, or a SNP. But because we cover the genome multiple times at every position, and that's really one of the requirements to be able to do variant calling, uh, we're going to be able, to, we're going to see uh, this, this SNP multiple times. So this is what we expect. Uh, so we can distinguish the two. Uh, so Mathieu mentioned already the fact that when, in the, in the context of the sequencing itself, even when it reads a base, um, it, it itself has some information because sometimes, uh, because every base that's read, the sequencer will report its, its error or predicted error, right? Because I mean, it estimates that just by how clean the signal is for that particular base. So depending on whether the signal is very ambiguous, uh, very clear or ambiguous, it's going to associate also a quality score to every base. So there is information that comes from the sequencer also that says this base looks suspicious. We call it an A, but we're not really sure. So this is, uh, this is converted into a quality score of every base. So as you know, typically, again, we, we hope or we expect to have a quality score around 30. That means, you know, the base, there's 99.9% .9 chance that that base is correct. Um, so when we do the SNP discovery, we also want to integrate that quality information because uh, if, even if you only see one read, so here you get the reference uh, on top, uh, on the bottom, not sure. So you say you have the reference on top, so when you read uh, even one read, there's a difference between some reads that say, you know, I see a T here and I have a high quality that this is a T versus I'm not so sure, um, you know, I think <coughs> it's a T, but I'm not sure. So this information that comes from the sequencer about the quality of every base, we also want to, uh, to integrate. Um, so, <clears throat> so this is a slide that I'm going to be quizzing you all at the end uh, on. So... Uh, no, but this is, this is the actual underlying, so this is for GATK, this is the underlying algorithm or, or, or calculation uh, to, to basically predict uh, what is the whether it's a variant and how likely it is to be a variant. And the details of the formula are not important. Uh, what's important is sort of what goes into it, right? So it's really... Um, so given the data at a given position, given all of the reads that you have at a given position, you want to calculate the probability of a genotype. So you want to calculate the probability that it's a variant, that it's different from the reference, or, you know, and, and have a score. So that probability that it's a variant will be converted into a score that we'll use downstream. Uh, there is part of the reason why this is a little bit more complicated than then um, that it, why the formula is a little bit more complicated is that every position, especially in the context of the human genome, you have two chromosomes, as we saw yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> so, so you have, so in some case, just like uh, in the example I had here, um, or no, this one's better. So in this example, um, you, if there's a variant, you don't necessarily expect all the bases to be different from the reference because you might have one chromosome that's different from the reference and one chromosome that's the same as the reference. So this kind of profile uh, is expected because you've got the two chromosomes. Uh, so the formula also has to take into account that at every given position you probably have, you can have two alleles. So that uh, also goes into the equation. Uh, but again, the, the detail of the equations are not important. Just to know that this takes into account, you know, how many reads um, are, are, are saying that there's a difference, takes into account the quality of the bases. Uh, so you see that here, actually. So it also takes into account uh, the quality of the bases um, uh, report, as reported by, um, by the sequencer. Um, so again, this is just 
sort of the mathematical representation of what we're doing with our eyes when we're looking at it, and we count how many reads say that there's a difference, and it, but it also incorporates the quality score and the fact that we expect uh, potentially two different haplotype at the same, uh, two different uh, genotype at that uh, that position. Um, so, uh, look, so showing up a little bit. So, <clears throat> just to re-emphasize some of the things that uh, that Mathieu talked about, there's a few additional things that beyond just, just that, that formula that calls how likely is it that it's a variant uh, given the data. Uh, there's a few things that are important to do. Uh, so so uh, these are four uh, steps and we're going to go through these steps. Um, well, you've done uh, some of these steps already uh, yesterday, right? So local realignment, if you remember. Uh, so one problem that happens is that <coughs> When the reads are mapped individually, right? So in the step of mapping, where you're mapping the step, the, each read individually. Um, but when you're mapping each read individually, the the best way to sort of align the very end of the read, you don't have much information to know uh, how to align the very tip of the reads like this. So what happens is that you tend to make systematic errors uh, where. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the mapping basically makes the same mistake multiple times. But by making the same mistakes multiple times, uh, it looks like very good if you compare it to the previous plot that I showed. These look very, very good as, uh, as variants. So if <clears throat> you simply take that data and feed it into the, the, the magic formula that I showed you, you would probably be calling uh, variants here and here. Um, so this <clears throat> local realignment step just identifies all the regions that have variants and then just double check that there's no way of repositioning the reads in a better way to explain that region. But now you're using the information from all the reads at the same time, so you're doing a better job. Uh, so that's what you see here. So if you just realign the reads, you find that there's a better way of doing all of these, this mapping that actually can now explain only just one indel. <clears throat> and it's really around indels, sorry, uh, it's really around indels that, that, that these types of mistakes tend to happen. Um, and, and that's why uh, it's, it's useful to do that realignment step. Okay, so <clears throat> local realignment, duplicate marking, uh, which you also saw yesterday. Uh, this is to, to, to recover from potential PCR artifacts. Uh, again, in the context of, of, the, of the variant calling formula, it's going to be looking exactly for these kinds of patterns of multiple repetition of, of a change, right? So, uh, but the problem is something else can lead to this pattern, which is if the same identical uh, DNA fragment ends up being PCR amplified, you're going to basically, and there's a mistake, and there's an error that was inserted, you're going to basically be reproducing that mistake, uh, so it's going to look like a variant. So same thing, so removing uh, reads that are identical, uh, you know, the pattern that you would want to see or that you would expect, if I go back, um, oops, if I go back to this, this is the type of pattern you want. You want reads of all sorts of different reads that are that are pointing to that variant, you, you don't want the, only the identical read uh, that might be a PCR uh, artifact to, to, to point to that variant. Uh, so by compressing, uh, by compressing these, you still keep one, but you compress it <coughs> to just one such that it's only going to be counting as one, pieces of e one piece of evidence for the calling. Uh, <clears throat> the last one that you've covered as well yesterday in the steps is this base quality recalibration. Uh, so if you recall, this is just because, because the quality score of produced by the instrument for every base uh, is used in the formula to calculate whether it's a variant or not. Uh, if <coughs> the sequencing instruments make systematic mistake uh, or sy systematic uh, uh, Mis-evaluation of the error rate, 
that's going to translate into bad variants being called. So doing this step of, of readjusting the scores that are produced, if you do that before, again, you feed that into the big formula, that's also going to help you. Um, so the, <clears throat> the last one that uh, you, you did, I don't think you covered yesterday that's also important uh, is population structure and in, imputation. In, in so, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so this is when you have more than one sample. Uh, so when you have more than one sample, uh, and, and suppose that, uh, so you have two haplotypes. So that particular piece of chromosome has only two versions in your population. Uh, and that's, you know, typically true. There's not so many <coughs> haplotypes in a population. So, uh, so suppose your population only has a, either the ATG or CGA, in that region of the, of the genome. Uh, and then you sequence, uh, and, and all you see are reads of this type below. Um, so can you give the value? Let's see if you guys are awake. So can you test and guess the value of n? Yes. yes. What is it? T. 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 OK, correct. So here, notice that it's quite, what you did in your head, it's quite different from uh, the formula or what I was saying before. Everything I said before was you're just looking at the evidence at one particular position and you make the call based on that particular position and the number of reads. What you guys ended up here doing in your head is the fact that because the human genome is organized such that you actually always uh, give segments of chromosomes or, or haplotypes, there is sort of correlations between positions uh, and then when you have information um, about neighboring position and information about, uh, like I have here in the population, you know, when you have a C here, you always have a G, or when you have an A here, you always have a T. So you can combine information from your population and, and things you've seen in other sample uh, to basically... Uh, make prediction uh, at the position. So this this type of um, varying calling is a little bit more elaborate, where you're actually using this information about the fact that there's correlation between uh, variants uh, when you're calling them. So again, this is a slightly more advanced way of improving variant calling when you have multiple samples, uh, is that you're using the structure uh, of haplotypes to improve it. So to do that, you actually have to, if you have to call variants using multiple samples at the same time. And this is especially useful if you don't have very high coverage. If you have high coverage in a position, right, if you have high, then, then actually you don't need to use uh, haplotype calling as much. But there are projects or, or, or instances where all you have is in, you know, 5x coverage or 3x. So every position in every sample ends up being covered just a few times. And then, and then you won't have, very, you know, so if you've only observed it once, you know, you don't know. So this is where using, you know, did I observe it in other sample uh, might help you as well. But again, this is a bit more technical. Uh, but it, it's just, it's been shown that, uh, you know, using multiple samples to improve variant calling can really help you. And that's especially true uh, if you don't have very high coverage. Um, so, you, so, so this is just a demonstration that the multiple calling, multiple sample calling ends up, can improve your, your, your variant call. But this is, you know, if you have, yes? I'm just not sure what you mean by um, multiple sample. You sequence it in the same, uh, without multiple? Sample? So you, see, you sequence it separately, but, but to call variants, you, you, you make use of information in other samples because, okay. right? So you, you don't call one sample at a time because in one sample, may, so assume, assume you only have, um, you only have five X. So most positions in the genome only have five reads. And so if you see a variant in one sample at one position, but you only have one read that tells you it's different, you might not know, you, don't, you won't have enough confidence to distinguish it's an error from it's a real change. But if you have a hundred individual, and in the hundred individual, you often see a change at that the same change, 
you can you can use that information to give you confidence it's probably real. Can you uh, weight the confidence difference three if there is if uh, uh, a sample is sequenced multiple times? I mean, uh, re extract and re amplify the sequence compared to multiple weeks. Yeah. Weight them differently. Yes. So I mean, if you're, I mean, this type of you know, identifying, saying I have multiple samples uh, to make the call would be used in the algorithm. If you have multiple data sets for the same sample, you can also use that. And actually there, if, there it's especially if, so suppose you sequence twice the same individual and the variant, you only see it in one of your batch of reads, that's probably a bad sign. So that's another thing uh, that, so it's very useful if you can, Verify that indeed that you have reads that are coming from both sides a little bit like uh, That's one of the things that's nice in IGV for instance You might want to double check that you've got reads that are going in both directions that are coming from both read sets that overlap and that call that variant so. Yeah uh, When using haplotypes would it be easier to simply have mother and father and, uh, Oh right child? no no absolutely so you can also do that um to verify that the calls are reasonable, for instance. So that's very useful in annotation as well that you can use on the variance, right? So once you've called the variance in the, if you have a trio, you could annotate the variant and make sure that the inheritance makes sense, right? And, and that which is another way you can actually improve your, the quality of variance. Um, yeah? Um, can you verify that based on the other, like, Using, like, healthy, you know, yeah, so we'll get to the annotation. I guess I'm, I'm getting into that a little bit. I mean, both here we're really just calling, and then there's going to be lots of ways of annotating the variants to further filter or improve them. But we can look at the frequency and thousand genomes and things like that. This is still not using any other data than, than the samples you've sequenced, and how best can you call the variants just using your sample. So within GATK, you have you can you have two modes in which you can run GATK. You can use it, you know, sample by sample, but you can also feed it multiple sample and use this haplotype caller uh, module. No, I mean, how is, how is genotype caller calling the variance compared to the haplotype? Is that the same so, way? Or? So I mean, again, so the difference is whether it's just doing the relatively simple form, well, <laughs> relatively simple formula that I showed, which is basically only using the, the data from one sample and the number of reads and the quality, or whether it's incorporating into the score some information that's coming from the other samples and the haplotype. Uh, why I'm asking that question, because sometimes within the same sample, if you use three types of callers, it yeah. Sometimes you don't get uh, consistent results. That's right. All right. Uh, so is it because, but you're saying that they are the same. You use the same formula to call a variant. Well, no. So the haplotype, if you're using the haplotype information, it's using a different formula oh, okay. that incorporates this okay. structure. And, and this is what this plot was showing, is that they've shown that the performance is also better, uh, oh, yeah. especially when you have not a lot of reads, right? Because if you don't have a lot of reads and that position is only in that sample is only covered by a few a couple reads, sometimes it's gonna get it right, sometimes it's gonna be make a mistake. If you then do the same at the same time you're looking in multiple sample, in each sample the calls will be a little bit better. All right. Um, so if you look at, at uh, the GATK framework, which is really what we're, uh, what we're following for our variant calling in this case, and, and is, um, so, so you had module two yesterday, which is really, um, you know, we did this, the mapping, the realignment, uh, uh, the duplicate marking, and the, the recalibration. Uh, in the context of the variant discovery now, uh, especially if we have multiple sample, and this is what we're going to do in the practical, um, not the practical of, uh, of this one, more the structural variant, but we'll do this distinction of calling variants 
using just one sample or using multiple samples. But this is going to be in the, in the second practical. But still, you, you get the idea. After, uh, after the, the mapping, we're going to actually be uh, doing the variant, uh, variant calling. Um, so to give you a sense of, uh, of this, the size of the data sets and the time the various steps take, uh, so yesterday it was mentioned that uh, you know, the files that come out of the sequencer, if you're sequencing a human genome, are in the order of 200 to sometimes 500 gigabase if you have high coverage. Um, so the first step, um, uh, well, so this is after the mapping, right? We get the BAM files that are roughly <laughs> this size. Uh, calling variants across the whole genome actually takes quite a bit of time. Uh, whether you're using GATK, which is what we're going to use, or there's other tools, SAM tools, Freebase, there's other ways and slightly different formulas of how you actually uh, calculate uh, where the positions are of the variant. So we're focusing on the GATK framework, but again, there's, there's a very similar strategies that are used by other tools. But if you're processing you know, all of that data across the whole genome to call variants, it takes uh, 10 hours or so. Um, so for that reason, we won't be doing it on the whole genome. We're going to be doing it just like yesterday, only on one particular portion of the genome. Um, but what you get after, uh, after this are the, just really a list of, of variants. And this is in the VCF format, and we'll go a little bit over this, this format. Uh, so these are all the sites that appear to be different uh, from, uh, from the reference. Uh, the size of those files are, are much smaller because now you're not keeping all the data. You're just keeping the data of the positions that are different from the reference with all of the extra information of the evidence that you have. Um, so, <clears throat> so now that we've called the variants and so on, I'll move to the, the second session section of what we're going to be doing in the module, which is, and we, we touched on that already, how do you filter and how do you annotate uh, the variants? Um, so I, I've been talking about this, this VCF format, so uh, if we look at it a little bit at the structure of that, uh, that format, and there's links on the, on the web, you know, with the full description of what that format is, is all about. Um, so the, the VCF file starts with lots of header files that just have information of what's down below and how things were calculated and so on, so what did you use as a reference. Uh, information about the various uh, information because this is sort of encoded in a way that then uh, is a bit cryptic but you have some information about um, what's what's in the file the, you know the main uh, so it's it's really just a file where in previous files you had read uh, that corresponded to lines here you have every re every line is really one of these variants it identifies the position of the variant, so in which chromosome, the position, um, whether you have a, a DB SNP ID, we'll get back to that. But basically it says, you know, the reference genome at that position has this sequence, and, and we've observed a variant, uh, and this is the variant we've observed. A quality score, a bit like what we had with the mapping quality, but this is now a quality of the variant itself. Um, <laughs> At some level, uh, whether it has passed, uh, so the variant caller will report whether, according to its algorithm, it, it actually qualifies as a good variant, so it's passed the filter, um, and then um, and then information more specific in the number of samples, the depth um, of reads that cover that position, and so on. But we'll we'll look more at, at some uh, some information, but that's the rough format itself, really one line per variant, some information about what's the reference of that position and what's the variant that, that we've observed. Yeah? Is the quality score uh, Fred or something? So it's Fred's scale, but it's the way it's calculated is not, there's not an, there's not an interpretation that's as simple as, you know, probability of error, but that's, that's still this, this scale. It's the same scale. But I say that it, it depends on the variant caller itself. So sometimes they actually use a different scale. So the mapping quality scores usually use the FRED scale, and then depending on the variant caller, 
they're not necessarily using the Fred scale. Um, it's really, so you really have to look specific, specifically at the algorithm and what's the quality score that there is. I, I use it more as a ranking usually because different algorithms use different scale actually for the, the uh, yeah, it's more, yes. And then for the specifics, it's good to look into the, the manual of the, of the software itself. All right. Um, okay, so so from the variant calling, we'll get one of these raw VCF with all the calls. What we probably want to do uh, some some variant uh, filtering. So typically, when you you get the raw variant calls, you have a lot of false uh, positives. So how can you filter? Um, so one way is to filter directly based on on specific parameters. Uh, you can have a filter based on this quality score or depth of coverage. You might say, well, I only trust, uh, you know, variants that are above a particular score and that have 10 reads covering them, right? So you can come up with yourself with some kind of, of rules of what looks like a good variant. And one way is to, to, to look at some of the variants maybe in the, in the browser and, and decide. And again, there's some, uh, but... Still, it's it's a it's a bit arbitrary. It sort of requires, and you know, it's it's not clear exactly how to define this. Um, by now, there's there's better ways of filtering uh, the data. Uh, in in particular, within GATK, uh, there's what's called a variant recalibrator. So, so this sort of builds up a set of rules itself. Uh, based on the raw output of what's the score and what's the depth of coverage, uh, it sort of will reorder and, and filter uh, variants that look suspicious. And the way it does that uh, is using uh, known variants. So, so far, uh, it wasn't, we weren't, we were really doing this sample by sample using only our data, but there's a way to actually use known variants to improve the variant scores and variant ordering. So that's called variant uh, quality recalibration. And, and the idea is that uh, <clears throat> you actually use uh, known variants that are coming either from the, uh, the HapMap project uh, to see whether you're actually uh, missing out. Uh, so you can use the, the very good quality uh, variants from the HapMap project to know whether you're missing out a lot of variants. Um, so you can also use dbSNP actually has a lot of, uh, of variants that uh, are errors in some case that have been detected in, in other projects and reported as been observed before. Um, so some of the work that was done by the team that, that set up uh, GATK was to to look to see uh, which variant, uh, you know, what was the profile of some, some of the, you know, overall of the variants call of the, you know, you have a set of very good variants and a set of more suspicious variants. And using that and comparing the scores, you can recalibrate the raw scores that are outputted to sort of filter out. Uh, and you learn sort of from previous mistakes and from good data, you learn from that and you recalibrate your score such that you can filter some suspicious looking uh, variant. So that's um, one of the steps that's, that's implemented in that workflow as well. So you input what are known as good variants and bad variants uh, to sort of fine tune uh, the variant calling algorithm. Um, so this is the filtering step uh, that's recommended. So again, if I go back, you know, you can have your own set of, of, of filters if, you, if you'd like. So you can set, I want to look at things that are above a certain score, that are above uh, a certain coverage, and so on. Uh, you know, there's reasonable ways of making these choices. Something that's, that's recommended in the context of using the GATK framework is to give, to you make use of, of known real SNPs and, and known potentially problematic variants uh, to, to do that filtering automatically out of your data. Uh, so that's one of the steps that we're going to uh, cover as well. Um, so 
on a slightly different topic now, not of filtering, but of annotating. Uh, this is a, a project that uh, I was part of that, that I wanted to, to show as sort of a, a motivating example. Uh, so in this particular project, and, and to give you a sense of, of the challenge ahead, so, so this is a project where we sequence 100 whole genome uh, kidney tumors. And when we did that, um, we're now looking not at germline variants, but at somatic variants. So these are new mutations in the tumor. Uh, but if we sequence 100 whole genome, uh, we detected more than half a million point mutations. Uh, so every little square here is is a thousand mutations. So we detected five uh, over a half a million change. So on average, um, you know, each tumor had close to five thousand, five six thousand uh, mutations. So there's mutations everywhere, right? So one challenge is how you know where do you start looking? So every tumor had uh, six on average six thousand um, mutations. Uh, one obvious annotation uh, is whether uh, these are coding mutations. So you see that there are a small subset of these mutations that are coding, so that's great, and that's one basic annotation you can do. Uh, but it's still then a little bit unsatisfying because um, you've sequenced the whole genome, you've detected all of these mutations, and there's only very few uh, that you're able to annotate. Uh, it's a very small subset that's hitting the gene. Those are still the interesting ones, and you want to annotate them as such. But it's just, you know, you get a lot of mutation, and you don't really know where to look. So how do you know where to look? Uh, so this annotation step is quite important. Uh, there's tons and tons of, of data, um, and we start talking about some of them. Uh, 1,000 genome and EBSNP and so on. Um, so especially if you're sequencing something like the human genome, there's a lot of annotation in the human genome. Um, so it's, it's important not just to take the, the raw VCF or the filtered VCF, but to also start adding information about whether it's hitting a gene, whether it's coding or non-coding. If it's non-coding, is it hitting some of these uh, encode elements and so on. So. Uh, there's different ways uh, that this annotation can be done. Uh, the one that we're going to be using in the, in the course is, is this SNPF uh, software that was actually developed by Pablo uh, Singalani uh, that was at the Genome Center for a while. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it doesn't, I mean, it has the advantage of already regrouping many databases and doing many annotation all at once. Um, so um, so to go back to this, this overall uh, pipeline uh, and, and the size of the, of, of the data sets and the time it takes, um, so typically, so by now we were at this stage where we have much smaller file, which are these raw uh, VCF, the variant call. Um, so it's good to uh, then use uh, potentially GATK again to filter these variants uh, and then annotate uh, and there's, there's different tools, but annotating these variants such that uh, you know which ones are coding, you know which ones are more likely to be impactful, and so on. Um, so uh, I think that's all I had in terms of an introduction uh, before uh, going to the, the actual lab. So, yeah? A bit of a tough question about the tumor sequencing. So yeah. tumors are so difficult to discover because they're typically you're dealing with a mixed sample. It's a bunch of good, healthy cells and tumor cells. Yes. So you're not looking at an even distribution. Of, yes. So you might have a, a, a mutant there only as a certain small percentage, maybe 5 or 10%. Yep. So how much extra sequencing coverage do you need to get to be able to confidently call? So not only do you need more sequencing, you also need... If you, so I the, the formula I showed had assumption on the genotype and the fact that it probably, you know, it expected basically roughly 0%, 50%, or 100% to call a variant. So you also need to adjust and tell the algorithm, I actually don't necessarily expect these proportion, and I want you to call variants that are at 10% or 20%, because if it's a mixed sample and the it, you might have a somatic change that it's in 20% of the, of the cells, so you don't necessarily expect these same proportions. So you need to make 
hopefully have sufficient coverage, and then you're still limited because if it's a very small, and un, you know, the, the advantage though is that typically, unless you're doing something very fancy, you're looking at something that's probably present in most of the tumor cells or something like that, and not the very small. There are other applications, but typically you're looking for variants that are not the rarest variant in the tumor. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, you don't necessarily su need super highs, but you definitely need to adjust the, the algorithm such that it knows that it doesn't necessarily expect 0, 50, or 100% of the read to be calling a variant. So, so is that something that you as the bioinformatician would have to do, or do you have to... Well, so there's specific variant calling software for somatic mutations. So something like mutech and so there's variant calls so there's already where you and you also you need to call the variants in some case it's even better if you give it the two sample the normal and the tumor and then and then you really sort of adjust and change the parameters a little bit so call it specifically yeah uh, you showed the formula at the beginning uh, and you highlighted the fact that you have something so there's gtk expect you to use uh, to work with the diploid organism? So, so there's settings there too. So you can you can specify whether it's not the case. That's by default is the expectation, but you can change that as well. But yeah, those that's definitely something that if you're not dealing with a diploid genome, you, know, you need to adjust. Mm -hmm. It seems to be misunderstood, but it seems to be trying to tailor for looking at the Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you know of software that's maybe better for calling variants in populations rather than individuals. Well, it's true that it's definitely tailored for that. By I mean, based on the setting, the raw variant calls, for instance, have all of this information right initially. Uh, so you can still revisit them, but it's true that the quality or the filtering, for instance, would not apply if you're actually looking at uh, at, at a population. And, uh, that's right. I mean, um, so, so um, I mean, there's definitely. I'm less familiar with them, but there's definitely colors and specific settings that allow you to do it in the context of population. But you need to. Maybe Matthew you knows. If you have a population in one sample, there's a tool which is called population, <laughs> which okay. aims to do that kind of thing where you have like a, you have your pool, it's a pool of population you have in your data, and you use like you use prebates to call to do the first calling of the variant, or uh, some tools, some patterns, and then you give it to a population. The population got fairly. I estimate to have this amount of haplotype in my What's the name of the software? Population. Population. <laughs> Put a note on the sticky note. Yeah. I was going to say for that one slide when you're like, okay, we should use multiple samples instead of single samples of variant calling. There was one algorithm at the top that was the beagle. Right. So that's that's really so. It looks like it's doing twice as good as the. So it's GATK Beagle. So I mean, this is an older slide. So GATK haplotype caller. Uh, this is is uh, similar to this GATK Beagle. So that's the haplotype caller module within GATK. Uh, I believe. <laughs> But again, you only get this type of boost and improvement for very low sequencing. So this is 1,000 genome type of sequencing where there was 5x sequencing, and then, of course, it makes a huge difference, right? But uh, otherwise, it makes a difference, but it's not, not as incredible. It does because even if you have 30x sequencing, though, you, are, you do have some regions of the genome where typically you have much lower coverage, and again, it's going to help you in those particular regions. But in regions where you have sufficient coverage, it doesn't help you that much, right? Yeah. And uh, what method is used to find indents uh, in the uh, genome? Like, uh, how can we trust them? Like, how uh, accurate are they? Because if there are, there are some bias in them, then we might use the real variant to 
because of groups and then the so the, the realignment, right, is based on not the indel calling itself, but just variance. So the regions that have lots of variance get realigned because there might be indels. Um, so so the, the indel realigner component is based just on, because if there's an indel, it's going to lead to lots of other variants around it, and then that's what gets realigned. Indel calling is still... Um, I guess I didn't have much on that in the slides. It's still not nearly as accurate and as easy uh, as, especially slightly longer indels or in regions that are a little bit more difficult. Uh, the problem is that indel calling, if there's real indels, the mapping step breaks down. So this goes back to what Jared was talking about a little bit. If it's just a SNP, right, you're going to get accurate mapping of reads in that region. If it's an indel, the mapping step that's the first step that allows us to look into that region is not as good, right? So, so indel calling is, is definitely lower, uh, lower quality in general. And there's, we're not covering that in much detail, but typically, yeah, you have to look at those, if you, especially if you're not using any specialized salt for specifically for indels, you have to look at those with a grain of salt usually. And then it's, it's uh, Again, there's lots of other algorithms that specifically try to call indels, but by default, the quality of indel calls is not as good as, as single nucleotide variants. Um, my next question is like, um, I'm not sure whether you're going to cover it in the uh, lab. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to annotate the uh, raw BCF with the filter BCF with the uh, BBC 138 uh, version during or 142, yeah. and after annotating, will it automatically? Uh, add the info fields, or we need to manually uh, add those info fields. Will after it add what? Uh, after annotating with yeah. the BBC file, yeah. do we need to add uh, the info in the data section? Like, uh, because for uh, AC, like allele count input, that is a uh, allele frequency input, that is GD is genotype. Right, right, right. Yes, you, well, you'll see that in the end yeah. of practical, in the end. So, so many of that will be added automatically as part of this SNP F annotation. Okay, so let's, unless there are other questions.